uh, just a quick update on the on the building. Most of you, some of you have been by there uh, and have seen what's going on. Uh, but we have uh, actually we we got several breakthroughs um, in the last week or two. Uh, amen. Yeah, it has got because we have got uh, the permission now from TxDOT to go ahead and finish the road. Finally, after after five months, uh, we can go ahead and finish the street in front of us. And most of you, some of you have driven by about two sides, a little over two and a half sides of stucco now. That's got the color up there. Uh, we got an inspection from the city. We passed all the inspections. Uh, <clears throat> the the plumber is gone. The air condition guy is gone, and uh, and the um, HVAC, the uh, who am I? Leaving? Electrician. He's everything is in there. Pretty much done. A rough end. We call rough end stages. And so we are now insulating uh, the walls. And so next week we'll be sheetrocking. And so uh, we'll begin to close this thing up. It's going to come to a fast close because I have projected. Uh, November 1 or before for us to get into this thing. So uh, uh, just a quick note on that. If, if somebody like some men, Rick or David or, or somebody, if, you, if you'll just put some people together, if you'll just, and ladies and men, it's, this is not limited to just the men come on over and working. We have just got a lot of stuff inside that needs to be picked up in trash uh, bags. Uh, if you got some, don't go home and get a trash bag. Go, go to somewhere get you a contractor trash bag, which is about this big and it's very sturdy. <clears throat> and, and listen, if, if somebody would just take that responsibility and without me having to say, would you do this? If somebody would just do that and put some lady or people together, and it doesn't have to be any perfect. You can come any time, day or night. I've got lights over there. I can turn them on for you if that's what you want. Uh, I'm there most every day. Uh, so if you can just picking up stuff and, and there's trash now we have to get this all cleaned up before they start sheet rocking you know this week because <clears throat> if what's going to happen is this trash is just going to be everywhere i'm just talking paper it's like paper off of the insulation there's little pieces of insulation laying around there is just you wouldn't believe how many plastic bottles of water <clears throat> if you if you collect plastic and you want to sell it just come on over i mean it's uh, there's a I mean, we drink like 10 bottles a day. I mean, so it's a, uh, there's a lot of those laying around and a lot of sawdust, things like that. Uh, we're not going to be a lot of sweeping going on because of the dust factor, but we just want to just push it in a pile, pick it up, put it in a bag, and just get it out. And so I can have my trash guy come and pick all that up and, and deal with it. So uh, if somebody would just do that, let me know what you got. That'd be, that would be great for me. Amen. Uh, we, have, we have got a great breakthrough. So we finally got okay from TxDOT that I said earlier. Uh, that has been an incredible holdup. Uh, they only have 30 feet there, but they're proud of that 30 feet. Uh, <laughs> and so <clears throat> they didn't want anybody touching that without permission, and we finally got that, and so we're so blessed to do that. Uh, see, if we might leave that even at anything. We're, I have actually been over there several, several hours a day. Uh, we've got lots of things. All the, the altar is actually finished. The sound booth is finished. Uh, JC's Coffee Shop. <clears throat> JC's coffee shop is, is all I got to do is put a little front on it so, so when you come in we're going to have somebody do some stuff with that but like a little awning that sticks out you know something like that so uh, we can we can do some certain things amen I got something going on I'm okay you got me thank you so much okay sometimes you tuck the, the receiver little receiver back here you see and you, get, you grab your coat and so I got to look good on picture you know just, <clears throat> I got a good little TV Amen. Are you ready for some word this morning? So, amen. So, wow, it's been a while since I've uh, actually been three weeks, over three, almost a month since I've been able to minister. But I ministered, then Dr. Sandy ministered, and then we had Apostle Leon in. Uh, then we had uh, Kathy Biscles in. And then, uh, you know, we're gonna, we have really blessed you in the last two months. We've had, we've had Dan Wheeler, the financial, in, and he'll be coming back next year. And, and so I think next month i got to get the date, but... Uh, Julie and Greg Bailey from South, uh, uh, some Australia will be here again, as they were here last year. And then on November the 18th, Bishop is going to be here. Uh, so if we can get in our building, November 1, or in that area, Bishop is, is going to dedicate the building. We'll have a Super Sunday or something and <clears throat> try to get everybody here at the same time. And because if we had everybody here at the same time, we'd be really full. And so uh, we're going to have a super Sunday. And so uh, get everybody. And so there'll be some little things going on all the time. But I'm excited about what's happening over there. We finally got a breakthrough. Things are progressing. So this morning, I want to talk to you about 
uh, breaking strongholds. Breaking strongholds. And I was, I was praying, you know, I've been asking God for a few weeks now because I've been, the three weeks that I've been off, I've really been busy over there, which is I needed the break to get that completed, uh, some things physically. I had to really go in there and, pe and people say, are, are you the pastor? And I said, yeah, I don't look like one, but I've got a skill saw in one hand and a pencil in the other and a baseball hat on, I'm, and I, but I'm working, right? Uh, and so, uh, but I asked the Lord, Lord what, is, what do you want me to uh, minister on? And, and, I, and I said, he said, I want you to talk on strongholds. And I said, but Lord, I just did a message weeks ago on holding your ground. And then after that, Lord, I, I taught a message on five signs of spiritual warfare. And now you want me to talk on strongholds. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me real clear, real clear. He said, surely you don't think that you're going to walk into a city and build a church that's going to glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords and you not come under attack. You are more mature than that. And I said, excuse me, God. I am so sorry. You are so right. And I began to bubble up. Something bubbled up inside of me, and I began to bind and to loose and to pull down the stronghold. And, Lord, I'm sorry for being meek and mild. As a, as, as I want to be like Superman. Glory to God. I want to, when, it, when the occasion arises, I want to put the big ass on and, and, and just say, Jesus, you are greater in me than he's in the world. No weapon formed against me can prosper. Thank you for the breakthrough, almighty God. You are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. Lord, I give you glory and honor and praise. If it wasn't for you, God, where would we be? And I said, Holy Spirit, you're right. He woke me up. Give me a call. And then Friday evening, you know how the devil, he, he just comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But I'm not going to show you scriptures that you haven't seen before. But what I'm going to define for you this morning is strongholds. Because it differs from the Old Testament to the New. And so I get home Friday evening and I do what I normally do. I pull in the driveway and I stop my truck or my car and I go to my mailbox. Because, see, I'm decreeing I want checks in the mail. But the devil is a liar. I got two letters in my hand that I'm going to mail and I'm going to pick up my mail. But I picked it up every day and I always get mail every day. Now, what's this? I pull open the mailbox, and I'm going to shove these letters in there, and my God, I slammed that thing, and I threw the letters up in there. Somebody, or somehow, some way, there's a snake oh, oh my God. in my mailbox. And I jumped back, and I said, how dare you, devil? I went over to my truck, and I, I got a stick in there about this long, and it's, it's, a, it's a closet rod. You know how big those are. And I grab it out of my truck. I go back over there, and I'm fixing, you know, don't, and for me, I'm sorry if you're an animal lover. <laughs> you can have python, leviathans crawling all over your house. I don't, I don't, don't bring it to my house, okay? Because, now this is, this is, thus saith, this is the book come out right out of the book of Mickey. Right here. I want you to know that the only good snake I know of is a dead snake. I don't care if he's a grass snake or a rubber snake or, I mean, I mean, whatever. But this little guy was about this long. And I don't know if it was a copperhead or what it was, but, but I opened that mailbox up with that stick. And I pulled that thing open, and there ain't no snake in my box. I'm thinking, how did you get out? If you've ever looked at a mailbox, it's seamed. Yes. Yes. There is no holes in a mailbox. No. <laughs> and so I said, devil, I'm not praying, uh, uh, going to be a friendly to you today. I'm going to tell you that I am the head and not the tail. Yes. Scripture says that my heel will bruise your head, and so will this stick. And I, I was angry. I mean, I mean, I was thinking, I was thanking God that I didn't run my hand in there. And that's the day, and listen, I always get mail. 
But I'm thinking, what if it had been nighttime <clears throat> and no lights and there had been mail in there and I ran my hand in there to get that mail? Glory to God. But that day, I look, there is no mail. There's a snake. So I called Dr. Sandy and I said, hey, <laughs> you would not believe what was in our mailbox. She said, Bill, get a check in the mail. <laughs> I said, no, but the devil's playing with us. And so I said, we need to wage war and we need to pray. So not that God would put a snake in my mailbox, but I think he opened my eyes to see what we we're battling and what we've been coming against because we're doing a work for the Lord that goes way beyond you and I. <clears throat> and so this morning we're going to talk about strongholds. I'd like for you to stand up, if you will, because when we talk about strongholds and we begin to talk about pulling down things, and this is not really warfare, but I want to really define something for you today. I want you to know that, that when you're standing, I want you to clear your mind. I want you to shake off. You know, it's a physical act. It's a prophetic act. Lord, just, I want all the depression. I want all things that's cluttering your mind. Lord, renew our mind from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. We loose any worries, any cares of this world. God, we clear our mind, our heart. We're ready to receive of your word in Jesus' name. You may be seated this morning. Now, some of you have been following Dr. Sandy, and she just did a webinar on silencing the accuser, which is one of her books. Six lies that, or eight lies that the enemy, did. how many know there's more than six or eight? You know, there's, there's a bunch. But, but she just did a webinar in that office there, at, uh, and close to 4,000 people was viewing. And she began to talk to them about spiritual warfare and the, the devil's a liar. And it, she's supposed to be through at 12.30, so we get her on a plane at 2.30. And <clears throat> at 1 o'clock, she's still talking. And so I sneak into her office, and, you know, uh, and she goes, you know, this type of thing. And she can't, I mean, you're looking at camera, you can't. Just kind of, hey, you know, she, I mean, you, you have to be, you know, she looked at me, it's kind of flashed, and she knew she got the message. And so by 1 o'clock, we closed down, we, we closed everything off, turned off the lights and stuff. And our office is, we don't, people don't go in there because it's actually full of lights. It's like a studio. There's really not an office at all. They've got lights and umbrellas everywhere. And, can't, you know, so, but anyway, I heard her to the airport, put her on the plane, and she did some great things, and then went to Nationwide on TV. So, so, but as I began to, put this together, I begin to think about what she did online, and, and we get the envy really mad. Yeah. You know, I enjoy punching him. I enjoy the just not a fight because I know who I am in God, and I want you to know who you are in God because when you get up of morning, you have the right to declare war on him, or you can say, I'm not fighting you today. Shut up, sit down, and get back where you belong. I'm worshiping my king today because, because we are king of kings and lord of lords. I mean, we are the sons of the king of kings and the lord of lords. We have the right to declare our victory. We have the right to declare who we, when we fight and who we want to fight. And, you know, like the old joke, you know, people said, you know, where a, a, a 200-pound alley cat sleeps. And I said, no. He said, anywhere he wants to. You know? So I believe that Christians, as we're believers in Jesus Christ, we have the right to declare war. We can say, I'm not fighting today. This battle is not mine. The battle is his. See, the, the, one of the tricks of the enemy is, and one of the strongholds he uses, to try to get you into the ring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can tell you and teach you how to win every fight. Yeah. Don't get in the ring. Yeah. Yeah. The battle's not yours. Amen. See, the trickery of the enemy is to get you out from where you are to occupy your time while you're battling this spiritual warfare and you're supposed to be praising God, and you're over here fighting somebody, and God said, I want you to worship me in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. 
I want you to battle, but I want you to know that you fight from the victory, not to the victory. So if you want to fight, go ahead and knock him out again. But if you don't want to fight, worship me all day. It's okay. It's amazing. God gave us 24 hours a day. He gave us eight hours to work, eight hours to sleep, and eight hours to do something else with. And so we begin to look at that. I know some of us work 10 hours, some of us work 12, some of us don't. I mean, but the, the point being is that God says, I want you to worship me, and you have the right and the authority to worship me anytime you want to. So turn with me this morning to 1 Peter chapter 5, and let's, let's look at the scriptures this morning because I think it's important here that I want to go back to verse 6, the one in front of that. I probably I didn't give you that, but I want you to look at this because I think it's important. Apostle Peter gives us some important things here. In verse 6, he says this. He says, uh, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And there's that word again, therefore. And when you see this biblically, you've got to know what that word is there for. Okay? Which means we have to go back and say, well, why did he put that word in that scripture? So if we go back and look, it, it says that uh, it talks about the church and the ministers, and he begins to talk about the younger being submissive to the older, and the older teach the younger, and for us to have humility and us to walk in the walk and talk the talk, but be peaceful and gentle and kind and mild-mannered and to do these things. And then he goes in and says, Humble yourself, therefore, in the mighty hand of God, that you may exalt you in due time. And he says, Casting all your care. Now, that's, that's, that's great. But how many knows we, we, we do not do that? Amen. Yet the Bible tells us to do that. We, he... He tells us to do that, but he wants us to know that he's, his shoulders is huge, that he is God. He is able to carry. May the government be up on his shoulders. He is the, the Alpha and Omega. He is the All Shaddai. He is the Yeshua, the anointed. He is peace, but he's also war. He's a mighty man of war. He's got this thing. So he says, I want you to not carry it. I want you to cast your care on me. He loves us enough, but he knows that we have to fight, right? So he says, put it on me. But when you do this, he said, if, while you're carrying this thing, I want you to be sober. In other words, I want you to be alert. And he said, I want you to be vigilant. In other words, I want you to know what's going on around you because your adversary, the devil, in other words, your opponent, goes around roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, and he tells us, his, now I want you to resist the, your opponent yeah, yeah. and stay steadfast in the faith. In the faith. What is faith? Faith is a substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. So we have to have faith to please God. Hebrews 11, 6 says, faith, you know, it, to please God, you must believe that he is. That he is what? That he is God. But if you believe that he is God, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So as he begins to tell us how to war, how to take our cares and cast it on him, he wants us to be peaceful. He wants to be humble in that, but also know that he is God. Yeah. And he goes on to say that, that knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, boy, that's a great word. Yeah. God of all grace, who hath called us into this eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that, you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. So, so we see that Apostle Peter tells us we got an enemy. We got this opponent going around, and he's looking. I remember you when you did this. I remember you when you did that. I see, he brings... He, he, the, you know, the enemy is, is kind of like some old friends. They lock you in time. And you can have a renewed life, but they, they want to keep you in the 70s or 60s or 90s or 2010 or whatever. When they saw you doing something you shouldn't have done or whatever, that, that focal point in their life, that focus stayed with them. And then now they locked you in the time, even though you're a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. <clears throat> so as we begin to, but Peter says, you know, you, you, the enemy's seeking. 
looking constantly. He never quits looking for weaknesses in our lives. Now, John 10.10 10 tells us this. He says that the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Three things. Now, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. But we get focused on the negative. How many of you, of you remember all the questions you got right on a test? We remember the ones we missed, right, or some of them. But that's the way we process things. That's the way, way we look. That's the way we organize things. But Apostle Peter says the, that there's an enemy out there. We have an opponent. But John says he's more than an enemy. He's not looking. He's not just looking. He's not just your opponent. He's come, to, and if you give him an opening, you, you know, you give him an inch, he becomes your ruler. He comes to steal. He comes, comes to kill. He comes to destroy, to steal. The, in other words, he wants your possessions. Anything that God has blessed you with, every good gift comes from the Father above, whom there is no variable, nor shadow of turning, James 1, 17. So we, we get these wonderful gifts from God, and all of a sudden, the enemy comes, and he wants to steal them because he don't have them. And then he wants to... The, to kill. No, he doesn't want any life around you. He wants you to go around dragging your chin all the time. He doesn't want you to have any joy. He wants to steal things around you that make you happy. He doesn't want any, everything that God has for you, he's against it. And so the enemy comes to destroy. He wants to futuristically. He wants no, he doesn't want you to do anything to reproduce yourself. He doesn't want you to get or to win somebody else for the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't want to, I don't want you, I don't want anybody to be what we call the old Christian. I want you to be alive and thrive and know that, that there's life. And some of you got people out there you know, you need to write them down, name, their names down. Now, Lord, I need you to get them saved. I need for them, their life to be changed. I know they're going to split hell wide open, but Lord, I've got their name on my prayer list. I need you to rise up and that evangelism within you begin to speak. So wait a minute, I don't want to be an old Christian. Old Christian is, is, is that, the pastor, you ought to be just glad that I'm at church. You don't want to do that. I want you to be alive and well. And some of you, you got some vacant chairs around you. You ought to fill them. Say, wait a minute, let me bring somebody. Let me bring somebody to the house of God. Let me uh, let you understand they're teaching to equip you, to train you, to activate you in the things of God because you've got a gift. You don't know it, but you have a gift of God. See, old school doesn't work. You can't build a Joshua church on a, on a Moses model. We've got to come out of this and know that we're going to have strongholds. Yes, we're going to have fights. Yes, we're going to have battles. But at the same time, we've got to have new order, new things. So Apostle Peter tells us that there's an enemy after us, but we are, and we've got to be aware that he's there. That, so when he comes, his tactics is to stop you. His tactics is to detour you, to get you off course, off focus, off vision. In other words, when attack comes, some people run to a safe place, and what happens, it becomes a stronghold. Let me define the difference between a stronghold, because in the Old Testament, it was designed, David, King David ran there, and you can see this several times, the patriarchs of old, when they were under attack, they would run to a cave. And then the cave would become a stronghold. It would be a strength, a place of hiding. It's a place of strength. It would be a place where they could, they didn't have to worry about their backside. They didn't have to worry about the enemy coming from the side. They just had one hole in this mountain, which is called a cave, and they could guard that, protect it. They could see the intruder coming at them. That's Old Testament. New Testament, Jesus is our hiding place. Okay? So the enemy uses reverse psychology. It says, says, I'm going to come after them. And so what happens, we have this terminology called stronghold. It's, called, it's not weak hold. It's called a stronghold for a reason. It is a strong hold. But it's not a place where you go and hide in the cave. It's a place where the enemy uses to separate you. To seclude you. Now, Old Testament terminology is that, yeah, we'd run to the cave, we'd hide, we're protected. In the New Testament, you run and hide under the wings of the shadow of the Almighty. 
See the difference there? So the enemy, if he can pull you into a stronghold, that was what he's going to do for you is, is try to steal, kill, and destroy things around you, seclude you. And when he secludes you, he steals your strength. When he steals your strength, because one can send a thousand, two can send ten thousand. So when he separates you, well, you don't need to go down there to that church. You know, people don't love you. All they want is your money. Come on, this is a lie of the pit of hell. This, you get, we have to realize and open and expose things like that because I know people today that won't even go to church because they're afraid somebody's going to ask them for an offering. When you don't understand the principle of tithe and giving, when if you understood it, you'd run to the altar and say, Lord, here, thank you for giving me my health this week so that I can prosper and my health can be in prosper even as my soul prospers. See, it's a, it's a seed. It's, I, mean, no, I don't know of a farmer who lives on 500 acres and sleeps all the time, never sows a seed. <laughs> if he sows something, he expects something to arise. And if he plants seed of corn, he expects corn. My dad was a farmer. I drove a tractor. That's how I learned how to drive. But the point being is that when we planted something, my dad didn't go out there and say, Oh, Shonda, <laughs> Lord, you got to bring forth this. Listen, he already had the word in him that said everything will reproduce after its own kind. And it must die. Put that seed in the ground. And then it's God. Say, God, it's your problem now. I did what you told me to do. You got to give the rain. You got to put the sunshine on it. You got to do your ingredient. You do your principles. I've done my part. That's the same thing we do when we talk, we, when we tithe or we give an offering. So, so as we give, we expect something to come back in return. People say, "Oh, you're just supposed to give to God." You don't expect. Listen, if when I give, I give. I don't know how I got there because this is on strongholds. But, but the enemy, what the enemy does, the enemy tries to use money as a stronghold and get you from the hold on. Listen, when you got a little bit, you need to sow it. No, no, I, 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 I don't know what I do. I'll bury it. You know. It does become a stronghold. But, but, but the principle of God, I didn't make this up. This is Bible. Was when we plant something, we expect the blessing. Yes. And so the enemy wants to come to steal and kill and destroy, wants to take your possessions. And he'll lie to you, get you secluded, and make you feel like you're all alone. So what's a stronghold? Let's define it. See, as we talk about the definition, it's actually a place where someone goes to stand off the attack when we talk about that. But that was pretty much Old Testament. But the true definition is a spirit of resistance that separates you from the, the captivity and puts you in captivity. And, but it separates you from others and it also separates you from God. It's all about, listen, listen one of the principles he uses is called Jezebel. Elijah ran a day's journey in the wrong direction, Right? And so what the enemy does, he, he comes to get us off focus. See, it, a, a, a stronghold is anything that think it has a right to be there. It's, it's uh, anything that comes against the knowledge of God. It's anything that is not in agreement with the Word of God. It is totally anti-Christ. It's anything that separates us from God. Are you with me? Yes. See, when we talk about breaking strongholds, it can be exhausting. Oh. King David found himself in a cave running from Saul, and he run and, and hid, and, and, but he also, he got refortified there. But when he was in the cave, we know the story there, you know, God sent him all the Triple D company. Yeah. <laughs> all the people he didn't want. You know, he's hiding. Mom, dad comes down to the cave, and all those in debt, all those in distress, and all those that are all messed up in their life, and they come running to David, help me. And David said, I'm hiding. Did you see me? I'm hiding. <laughs> Using that as an example, what happens to us in the New Testament stronghold, we seclude ourselves. The enemy gets you pulled away from the people that love you, pull you away, because he throws little thoughts in your mind like, 
You don't fit over there. <laughs> you know, you've been there more than, you've been there three weeks or three months. You can't get in. They won't let you involved. Come on. Mm. Have you told anybody what gift you have? <laughs> it's a two-way street. Amen. If you know anything about Dr. Sandy and I, we want to use you. Yes. You know, we, have, we know that the marketplace ministry is important to us. But the enemy wants to separate. The stronghold is called a stronghold. It's designed to wear you out. Literally, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel talks about this. He says, and he, meaning the enemy, talking about the last days, and he shall speak words against the Most High. In other words, not only is he against God, he's against you. Because you are for God. Anything for God, he's against. And he said he's going to speak great words against God and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Is that you? Yes. Yeah, because we're glorifying God. He's going to try to wear you out. He'll use trickery. He'll pull you out. He'll throw things in you, stumble you, and he'll, he'll th get you fired from a job, or he'll do this over here, or he'll do certain things. He'll throw th stumbling blocks in your way to just to trip you up. So take your focus off of worshiping God so that you have to battle over here, and it becomes a stronghold. You say, God, I can't win this by myself. And so what happens? You seclude yourself away from the people that can help you the most, and that's a lie of the pit of hell. He said he will even think to change times and times and half a time. If you read that theologically, it's a year, two years, which is three, and half a time, which is half a year, which is three and a half years. This is where they get the pre-post and uh, millennial when it, people say, we're just coming in, we know we're going to rapture out of here in the first before the seven years, and oh, no, we're not going to be raptured until the three and a half years. No, we're going to be post-millennial. We're going to be at the very end. We're going to go up as a welcome committee and come right back. <laughs> Theologically speaking, we have to understand that it doesn't matter where you go up and float around and work and do whatever for seven years. You're going to come back on earth. If you, go for, if you go through tribulation for three and a half years and what this scripture says and you go up and you spend another three and a half years and you come back down again and then, or if you're a post-millennial, which means that you see him bust in the cloud, you go up, we're right back, we're taking over, okay? Regardless of where you spend time up there or not, where do you wind back up? You wind up on earth ruling and reigning. So let's don't get caught up on the, I'm a panologist. I just believe it's all going to pan out. Okay. What we need to understand, we, see, we get caught up denominationally trying to figure out, are we going to be out of here for seven years? Or are we going to have to go through seven years? Or, you know, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm out of here on the first load. Okay. I don't know where that's going to be or when, but I'm not going to waste time trying to figure it out. Listen, I'm going to rule and reign until Jesus comes, and when I hear the shout, I'm going to be, like, okay. I'm going to be traveling 186,000 miles per hour with the speed of light. <laughs> Fastest I've ever been in my life. But we have to know that the enemy is going to wear us out. So what happens to us when we find ourselves in a cave? What happens when we find ourselves withdrawn? Now, talk about a, a spiritual cave here, not, not the Old Testament where they would actually went to a cave like David. I'm talking about... A, a spiritual cave that you seclude yourself. You separated yourself from the intercessors. You have separated yourself from your best friend. You have separated yourself from, you're, you're a loner now. You're a contemplator. You have pulled yourself apart, and now you're crying out for help, but nobody can hear you. It's because you're not saying anything. You're not reaching out. You haven't made any calls. You know, if you understand the Bible, you have to understand that when we are in trouble, we need help. We call somebody. We say, you know, 911 pastor or 911 intercessor or something. You call to get help. Let somebody pray you and be honest with them. Don't give them some religious garbage of, of Sean died. I've been crying all day and the devil's beating me up. And What you need to do is say, the devil's after me and I need your help. This is why I don't want you to get involved in my whole life. I just want you to pray and decree and declare with me that I'm an overcomer, that, that, that there's life and death in the power of my tongue. I am victorious in Jesus' name. And help comes from the Nile and hills, and I'm going to be able to rule and reign. You 
speak Bible to them. Now, let me let me throw something in here that might help somebody too, because don't put yourself in agreement with somebody who's doing silly stuff. That's right. Amen. You need to help me. I'm praying that so and so is my husband. You need to help me pray for that. <laughs> let God tell the husband that <laughs> it would work out much better. I promise you. But a cave or a stronghold separates us from others. It causes us to be weak. See, when we step into a greater dimension, I need you to get this because talking about strongholds, when we step into a greater dimension, a new level spiritually, the enemy is there to challenge us. Don't think you're going to get a new job and make $20,000 more a year without some type of challenge where it comes through some Jesse has been working there for five years and you show up and all of a sudden they don't like you and you got all this education and how to come you get paid the same rate I'm paying. I've been here five years and I got seniority over you and you have to do all this stuff and they start throwing paperwork at you and you say, wait, wait, I work for him or her. See, the, the enemy is involved. See, you, got, you need her. You can change her life. Maybe God sent you there to that job to change her life. So, so you carry this anointing with you. See, so when we step into a greater dimension, you know, we, we need to understand that there's going to be challenges. There's going to be things that comes against us. Listen, here's my, here's my strategy. Let me share this with you. When, when my attack on stress and chaos, when it comes against me, what I do is I put in new order and new structure. It's really simple to me because I'm... I function a certain way. I'm a C personality. I function with details. I like details. I don't have to have them to function, but I like them. But, but the point being, when, when the enemy starts throwing all this, out, when I get so clouded up with so much stuff and overpower the enemy, chaos, and I said, okay, well, hold it. Stop. Structure, new order. Old order will not work with new levels. I'm, I'm teaching you something this morning. If you if you if you listen, because because what happens? Anything new in our life requires new structure. It doesn't mean that we can't do something. It just means we cannot do it with the old order. See, now old order does work in some things, but not in everything. So so when new levels, new positions, new marriages, new jobs, new homes, new car, new house, whatever it may be. Anything new requires new structure. So we have more weight at new levels. Charismatic slogan for that is new levels, new devils. <laughs> They're not new. They've been here a long time. It's just that you're in a new territory. You've got to step up a new level to have new structure with new order. You, you were successful in that territory, but now you're in a new territory Old order may not work in your new territory because you're fighting different demonic strongholds. And they don't want to be alone. They want you to come down the dirty road with them. They want to suck you right on down with them because they know, you know, they know you moved into their territory. Now they need to get the big chief. Come on. So, so let me ask you this. I know that because we have more weight, we have more responsibility, we have more strongholds are broken with new structure and new order. That's how you break this thing. Let me ask you this. I know you're praying, but do you have the structure and organization for what you're praying for? Wow. Well, Lord, I just need a new wife, a new husband. I need a new husband. Not a new one, but Lord, I want to need a husband. Put it that way. <laughs> Some people do need a new husband. Okay? But my question to you is this. Are you living like a wife? Well, Lord, I'm looking for a wife. Well, Lord, I need a new, well, I need a family. God, I need a, will your income support what you're praying for? See, we 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 got to get the cart. But you know, sometimes we get the cart before the horse. We we got to realize there's things that we have to function with. We have to have wisdom in some things. We just can't float through the world and somebody slaps you with five dollars. Say, woohoo, I'm rich. Come on, we're talking about strategy this morning. The enemy wants to pull you into a stronghold to separate you. Yeah. It's difficult to maintain new blessings with old order. Yeah. It really is. See, the, the, we first must deal with our principal thing. 
We have priorities. See, the, then, then we deal with those things around us. Are you following me? Are you with me? See, because we have priorities. What's priorities? The priorities are the priority things that need to happen first. If you spend all your time on the non-priorities and the things that nice to have over here, and you spend all your effort, you're going to lose your priority. In other words, you have lost vision. You have lost focus. Are you all getting this? Yeah. What happens is we start being, we, we're going to be the helpmate for everybody. If you're a counselor, you're an intercessor, you're a prayer warrior, or you're just a born-again believer, people will pull on you. It's like you got the only swimming pool in the neighborhood. People need you. They don't want you when that you want them. They want you when they want you. See, but but we got these principal things, the priorities. If we focus on other things before our priorities, we start spending our energy on these other things, which really it matters, but not priority does that make sense and then we get mad at ourselves because we don't have time to fix what we need to fix and then we start blaming the husband we start blaming the wife we start blaming the oversight we start blaming the church we start blaming the listen it's not about us it's about you and him he has perfect order if there's order in heaven there'll be order on earth listen some people spend their lifetime Fighting with their self. Seriously, if, if you've been around men and ladies for any period of time, I'm talking about groups, you'll understand that, that well, you know, Pastor, you know, I've got to get more holy. I'm born again. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. But, you know, I, what I've been through, there ain't no way God's going to just accept me the way I am. I've got I to serve more. I've got to work more. I've got to pray harder. I've got to pray longer. I've got to do, oh, I've got to work for God. You know, there's a big difference between working with God and working for God. Incredible big difference. See, but we sabotage our spiritual life by trying to become holy. And yes, we're still talking about strongholds. See, see, please hear me this morning because I'm trying to use some wisdom tactics to set you free and to pull you out of some bondage. See, because we exhaust our energy worrying about somebody else's emotions, we lose our focus. If you're not well, how in the world can you help somebody else? See, when we, we, our lives become unstable, when we become unstable, we're a wreck. And then all of a sudden you get a call and say, hey, i got this going on. I need you. You go, oh, yeah, boy, you jump right on that. Beelzebub cannot cast out Beelzebub. You can't sleep with the enemy one night and expect to get victory the next day. Come on now. We've got to understand that this stuff is real. We, we've got to quit man be pamming around being the, the, the lukewarm Christian that Revelation talks about the, the church that's lukewarm and he'll spit you out. I'm talking about the church of Philadelphia, who the church has got faith that moves. And he said, I saw that in you. You are moving by faith. Wow. See, we can't spend all of our time, energy on problems that we can't fix. My God, I think I just hit a home run. Because we exhaust ourselves trying to fix somebody else, and we, we're having a whole issue trying to fix what we got. I'm not saying don't help others. That's not, that's not the point. The point is, is get yourself fixed. Get yourself prayed up first. Go, listen, you want to go into the deliverance ministry? Get deliverance. It's, it's pretty easy. So, I, oh, listen, I know there's times when we spend a quality time with someone, and, and there are times when we're going to spend time with a lot of people that need a lot of help. But and there's some things, first thing you've got to learn as a senior leader or being a biblical leader or understanding Christianity is the fact is there are some people you cannot help. We want to help everybody, but we got to also you've got to recognize your strengths and your weaknesses so that you don't be pulled into a stronghold of the wicked one. Amen. See, when, some, so when something is out of focus, change is required. When problems become clouded and our focus is clouded, strongholds start forming. 
because it's just a trick to get you sidetracked, to get you in a, down a path or down a road that, that, you, that you don't want to go down, but you're already here, say, so I'll just make the best of it. See, we've got to use this spiritual gift called discernment and discern, am I supposed to do that or not? What happens if we get too many people doing too many things, what happens is we jump in the O.W. word. What is that? Overwhelmed. Oh, I'm just overwhelmed. How did you get there? Well, under the circumstances, Pastor, you'll never believe. I say, what are you doing under there? See, when our normal becomes a prison, it's time to break out of jail. See, there are times when a person is locked up in a prison and they spend uh, so many years in a prison, 20 or 30, 40 or 15 years, whatever it may be, different for different people. But sometimes a, a, a person gets incarcerated for that long. What happens? And then they get out, they get free. They don't know how to survive in a world that's, that's moved on without them. I know we had a guy in our church years ago who came in from prison for 15 or 20 years and he couldn't find a job, couldn't get in a job. Of course, it's on his record, the felony and all this kind of stuff. And I get all that. But the point being, I'm, I'm trying to give you an analogy between a spiritual stronghold and what somebody's done in the natural life. Because if you don't know what a stronghold is, you can't survive in a spiritual world. See, the, what happens is he tries to do all this stuff. You know, he, he's used to three meals a day. He's used to uh, a bed at night. He's used to for security. I mean, he, I mean, you think, well, he's in jail, but he's got security. He doesn't have to worry about the bar's closed. Ain't nobody going to jump in his sack. Come on. He has got security. And in the world, he says, we're on guard. Who's going to break into my house? I don't have any bars on my windows. I've got a nine millimeter close by, but come on. You understand what I'm saying? But the, the enemy wants to pull you away and have you in a stronghold so that you can't succeed. Listen, I want you to get this because there are believers today that attend church regularly. I mean, they love God. They serve God. They believe God. They pray for people. They get miracles. They get breakthroughs. But they find themselves in a stronghold. There are leaders of churches. I'm telling you, there's leaders in churches today all over the world. They are elders. They're senior elders. They're senior leaders. They're senior pastors. They're associate pastors. And they go home at night. They can help everybody at church. They go home and they say, oh, God, set me free. They got a hidden bondage that they can't tell anybody. They're hidden. And so they're trying to help everybody. They're trying to fix everybody and can't fix themselves. That's what Apostle Paul said. I got this thorn in my side and I can heal everybody get signs and wonders and miracles but I can't fix this thing stronghold listen there's people who wake up daily and fight the devil all day long you say pastor really I'm telling you there is people who does not know what freedom is because they've been in the stronghold so long that they think that is their way of life. That's how they survive. They're supposed to get up fighting every day. And they are constantly wore out. If you're, if you're healed and you're set free and you know about this stuff, you can see them. You, you, can, you can sense them. You, you know what kind of demons they are fighting. Listen, and you want to help them, and we do. But the point being is that just because we do spiritual warfare, we, we got to know that there's, there's times and seasons when every spiritual fight we get into is not a stronghold. Right, right, right. But the ones that fight all the time, my heart goes out to you because you have not gotten the revelation of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Because he came and he died just so that you will not have to do what you're doing. We started this whole message off on, Apostle Peter said, cast your cares on me. That's what Jesus said. Oh, I know it's hard to do. Because what we're, our first is, you know, we can make this thing happen, God. And I can handle this. And then we exhaust our, our 
energies, and all of a sudden we said, wait a minute, God, maybe I can't handle this. When it, you could have saved three days' worth of work if you would have said, God, I, I, I recognize where I'm at. Sick them. Get them. Because I can't handle this. This is too big. You know, and, and if it's, even if it's not big, it, it's, you shouldn't be able to fight. The, the victory, see, the enemy is there trying to pull your focus off, get you out of focus on something else when you should be doing this for God and serving God, and, and then you're over here fighting the devil when, when the, the enemy wants to come to steal, to kill, and destroy. Remember, he goes about like a roaring lion. Not he's a lion. Bishop's got a picture of his line of the devil. He's got God's line of Judah over here, and the line over here's got no teeth. He's got... I mean, demonic God, strength and power. Remember, Apostle Peter told us that cast our cares on him, but let us not be fooled to the, about the spiritual things as we walk in our life. We must be spiritually aware that there is an enemy around us, that he comes to steal what we have. If Jesus, people say, well, Pastor, I don't ever war. I just... I just sweet Jesus. I get up every day and I worship and I say, oh, glory to Jesus. Glory to God. It's so wonderful to be a Christian. He solved all my problems. Glory to God. Listen, if Jesus didn't want us to war, he shouldn't have given us the military uniform. The helmet of salvation. The breastplate of righteousness. Our loins are girded with truth. Our, our shoes are shod with the preparation of the gospel. A shield of faith and a sword of the spirit. And they're all for forward advancement. There's nothing back here. So you can't turn and run. You get an arrow in your back. So we advance. Moving forward. Get up and say, that we on fire today? You don't fight today? And he'll say, oh, yeah, let's get it. And he'll say, no, nah, it's not my fight. Here you go. Get him. <laughs> you need to trick the devil sometimes. He tries to trick you all the time. So, but listen, anytime we, we lose focus, we have to have new structure. Let me give you a great example. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That camera back there, now, I have, they have me in focus. I'm probably look good on camera, whatever, but I've got an area here. I've, I can go up to so far maybe, maybe a second row. I can move over to about third chair over here. I can move over to about the third chair over here, and I'm the pastor, and I can't get out of my area here. You know, no, no I really can, but they have guidelines for me. If I want to stay in focus for the camera, I have to do, be in a certain area. Now, watch this, because I think the Holy Spirit just gave me this. But if I get out of my area, if I get out of focus, what if I get back here? They have to refocus. Why? You know, they're away from me. Don't do this. Don't do this. You know, okay, I'll get back where I'm supposed to be. Okay, here. My point is this. The enemy will get you out of focus. When you're out of focus, you can have a new structure. I'm still the same person. I'm still wearing the same clothes. I'm still talking about the gospel. I'm still doing the same thing, except I am out of focus. Why? Because I got out of my area. See, when we sin, we get out of focus with God. And then the enemy says, I got him in focus. But you're out of focus with God. And God says, Get back in. He, he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. It's us that, that gets out of the picture. It's us that gets out of focus. Amen. See, so, so a great analogy. So, but we have to stay in focus with God. If we get out of focus, then we've got to have a new structure. Amen? Stand with me this morning. See, what we've got to know is anytime. We're in a battle with the wickedness of this world. We got to have a mindset that we are not the victim. So many believers, and it's, it's sad to say this, but, but, you know, I'm very transparent as your pastor. Some people, when they get into a situation 
they become a victim. I know people that's been limping around spiritually for years because they think everybody limps, so they're normal. Well, everybody has this. Everybody does this, so you're in a normal group. When you get out of normal, listen, you're going to sense something about yourself that's totally freedom. Maybe what happened to me? Well, you got away from this burden. You got out of this stronghold. You got into some free dumb things. You're free. He who the sense sunsets free is free indeed. Listen, you know when you're in a stronghold. You know when you're war totally out. You know when a new structure and new order has to come into play. You know when things are not right. We're not, we're not ignorant of the Bible, but we, but we also got to come alive, know what's in us. Listen, nothing can come out of you unless you put something in there. <laughs> that preach. You know, it's amazing when Jesus looked at his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 and 16 there, and most of us know this scripture where the disciples were sitting around and Peter got this incredible revelation that who do you say that I am, Peter? And Peter said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And in verse 19 of Matthew 16, 19, it says that, hey guys, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And I put this in my book and I kind of gave you know, an illustration there and wrote a couple pages on this thing because I really feel like the disciples sat around, made it live in Bible style. I mean, Hey, John, you, the, the disciples, you, um, hey, you know, uh, the keys. Um, I wonder if it's the same keys that, what kind of keys are they? They're not keys. I mean, man, the old keys, those keys are big to unlock the old doors. You know, that's keys. No, and, and, and James folks say, oh, no, no, not that kind of key. It's a spiritual key, you know. And when all reality, Jesus was quoting something from Isaiah chapter 22, 22. That says the keys will open a door that no man will shut, no man will shut, nobody's gonna open. So Jesus was saying, Hey okay, guys, I'm giving you the keys of kingdom, but what they forgot that he is the key. Yeah. Jesus is the key. When you have him, you quit looking for keys. He is the key to life. He is the key to break out of a stronghold. He is the key to freedom. He is the key to prosperity. He is the key to success. He is the key to overcome. He is the one. He is our shield. We don't have to run to a cave. He is our shield. He is our buckler. Glory to God. Listen, we got to understand that in my God that I will trust. You know, Scripture tells us maybe a thousand fall at your side, but your ten thousand fall at your right hand. We we know that He is our shield and our buckler, and we can rule and we can reign. We can do these things in Christ Jesus. In Him. We trust. In Him, we can boldly come to the throne room of God. See, Jesus wasn't just merely speaking to them and giving them some type of cute little scripture like, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, guys. What He's saying is, I'm going to die and I'm going to go away. I'm giving you me. I am the keys to the kingdom. I'm, I'm giving it to you. Then in the next, after, immediately after that, He said, don't tell anybody. Isn't it amazing? So here's the altar call for today. That we're victory. We're not the victim. We're the victor. Because I know people that will hang on to a sickness so that people will love on them, give them things. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. And then you got people who that do get sick and they say, oh, I'm fine. They don't, don't, I mean, I'm good. I get both sides of this. I understand that. But please understand that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man gets to the Father except through me. Not good works. Not how many hours you can pray. Not how many, how many Bible scriptures you can memorize. Not how many churches you've attended to or how many sessions you attend. Scripture is real clear. When you come out, you come out. Jesus is the only way. I've known people around construction sites for years. They say, oh, I know God. And I said, no, no, no. You don't understand. I know you know God, but do you know Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God? Well, I know God. 
I'm a good person. I help people all the time. And I have to really conclude and, and go after them and say, look, let, let's talk about this for a minute. I just talked to a guy yesterday at, at the church building. I said, are you a believer? He goes, no, I, I, my, my brother's a Christian. I said, you need Jesus. And I'm the Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. Santos, you need him. He said, well, I don't, I don't know. And I said, would you, would you want to pray? No, I don't, I don't, don't know how to pray. Listen, you don't have to go overseas to find somebody that's lost. You work around people that doesn't know Jesus Christ. Well, my heart is crying out to you this morning is, is to rise up out of the stronghold that the enemy has silenced you. He'll let you come to church. He'll let you stand. He'll let you sing praises and lift your hand and dance in the spirit and be free and say, oh, glory to God, and give you shouting. But you know what? He won't let you be the evangelist to reach out and say, do you know Jesus as your Lord? Would you want to go to church with me? I, oh, I've been to church. I don't like the way. You ain't been to our church. You hadn't been to LifeGate yet because when you walk in, something happened. I don't know what it is, but something happened, and it's good. I'm serious when I say that. The family of God that are at LifeGate, when I walk through the door, even if nobody's here during the day, I'll come in here and I'll walk around and pray. I may get a glass of water, or I'll sit down and play a, a tune on the keyboard or whatever, and I'll sit here and I'll worship God for five or ten minutes, get up and go back to work or whatever just to cool off. But there's a presence of God in this place. loving you, want you to be free. So if you're here today, if you find yourself always fighting, if you find yourself that, that I've been in a fight and I feel like I have to war and I have to fight and you need to let us pray for you. If you find yourself feeling secluded or alone or, you know, I don't really fit in any church. I just, I've been to several of them. I just don't fit. I'm telling you, you fit. But the devil is seeing your life. What, listen, in other words, why would the Scripture want you to jump from that church to that church to that church to that church to that church when the Scripture says to be rooted and be planted? I'm not talking about visiting. That's all I'm talking about. Because God will have people visit churches all over and just figure out what fits for them. I get that. But what I'm saying is, but God wants you to be stable. He wants you to grow I've said this before, I can have a plant over here, I can pull this plant out of this pot, and I can stick it in this pot over here, next week I can yank it out of that pot, I can stick it back in that pot, and next week I'll yank it out of that pot, and put it back in that pot, even though it's got soil, even though it's got mixture, that plant is going to die. The reason it was going because it cannot attain any root system. And God wants us to be strong and mighty in Him. So if you're feeling secluded or if you're feeling alone, this altar calls for you. If you're feeling you can never overcome, Pastor, I can never feel like I can never measure up. It's for you. It's for you. So would you bow your heads this morning? I'd like to go ahead and get the prayer team up as well while they're moving the altar. I'd like to go ahead and get the prayer team up as well. Because... If any, any of those things that I discussed with you, listen, you need someone to lay hands on you. You need somebody to just agree with you in the Word of God that you can overcome. I don't know about you. I find myself in the midst of warfare a lot. I get on the phone and I say, hey, Bishop, I got his phone number. He's my pastor. I call him. He may be in Ghana somewhere or Papua New Guinea or wherever it may be. Hey, I mean, I'll call him. I said, Bishop, where you at? He said, I'm in Papua New Guinea. What's up? And I said, I need prayer. And he'll say, well, what's going on? And I tell him, and he began to war. Father, in Jesus' name. Listen, don't, don't try to fight this thing alone. It never was meant for us to fight alone. It was meant for us to join and agree. And when we agree with the Word of God, if one can send a thousand, two can send ten thousand. In other words, in other words, we need to know that, that we're never alone. The strongholds wants to seclude you. They wants to get you alone. The enemy, he will even tell you, oh, you got everything you need. It's just another lie. He lives on lies. So as they sing this morning, as they begin to praise God, we need to break some chains this morning. Break the strongholds. 
Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Because there's power in the name of Jesus. Father, we bless you this morning. We give you glory and praise. Lord, we will not be the normal Christian. We will not be a pew setter without the gospel being in us and alive. Father, we speak life to the word this morning. We thank you. Greater are you that's in us than he that's in the world. Lord, it's not my fight. It's your fight. But, Father, we thank you. You put us on earth to torture the devil. We, you put us on earth so that we can overcome by what we speak out of our mouth and what we speak in our heart. So, Father, I thank you that by the word of my testimony, we're overcomers, that we're not the, we're not the beneath, but we're above. We're the head. We're not the... We're, not the tail. Father, we can run through a troop. We can leap over a wall. We can do the things you said you would bless us exceedingly abundantly above all that we even ask or what we can even think of. Lord, that's the kind of God that you are. So I give you praise this morning as we pray for those who need prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today on this Facebook Live video. Most Sundays we have altar call, which is personal. And for that reason, we do not air this part of the service. We hope you understand and that you enjoyed the message. If you have any questions or concerns or if you have any revelation from the word today and you'd like to share it, or any testimonies for that matter as well, please reach us as on social media and those links will be following. Thank you so much and have a blessed day. Oh